headline. It was also reported on in the BBC. UK bans self-defense expert from entering the country. That story is up at Infowars.com. Government wants a nation of cowardly, defenseless victims. And what's happening is you got people coming in from Eastern Europe, third world countries, very, you know, uh, you know aggressive, crime-plagued areas who are pretty tough. And they run into the now desensitized, brainwashed Brits. And I got two crew members, Paul Watson and Steve Watson, who live there and work there. And they describe it as that. That when people get attacked or somebody's wife gets attacked, the average person just lays down and takes it. I've seen cases where a woman is in her house being attacked. She stabs someone with a butcher knife and they arrest her. There's many famous cases of this. And so they just go after you if you defend yourself because the government wants the power monopoly. Uh, and uh, Tim Larkin uh, heads up uh, one of the leading groups out there, TargetFocusTraining.com. Here's the headline, I never dreamed I would come to this, but they banned me in the UK. Is my training too violent? This will be some of the best business he ever gets. Uh, not that uh, he needs it. For over 20 years, uh, he has headed up and, and run and created uh, the organization Target Focus Training. And Tim Larkin has been uh, well known in the self-defense and combat close training world, uh, but under the radar to ordinary folks like you. He's the guy operations like the U.S. Navy SEALs, and U.S. Special Forces, and U.S. Border Patrol call in behind the scenes to teach them when it is kill or be killed. During the last 20 years, he's trained not only the elite military special forces and law enforcement units, but corporate and civilian clientele in New York, Las Vegas, London, and other cities around the world using a combination of live training sessions and DVDs. A sought it for public speaker, Larkin has spoken to CEOs, government officials, and business leaders in over 40 countries on how to use the same principles of surviving life or death violence in the less life-threatening environment of business. And uh, he joins us now again, Target focustraining.com uh, is the website. Thanks for coming on with us. Hey, thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Uh, what do you, uh, why do you think you've been banned from the uh, UK? I mean, break that down, how that happened. Um, you know, I, I think obviously it's a gross misunderstanding of, you know, who I am, what I do. And, and also I think it was just a, uh, I think it was a, a quick reaction to uh, some comments that were made after the riots in uh, in August, <clears throat> and I, I, I'm pretty sure that people just did a quick view of a couple of articles of who I was and didn't really look into my background at all and uh, thought it would be just an easy fix. I think they, I think they were thought they were banning somebody who was kind of a kill them all, let God sort them out type of guy, and um, you know when when I was banned, <laughs> you know when I found out at McCarran Airport in Las Vegas on Tuesday when I was presented the letter that I would not be uh, allowed to travel to the UK anymore. Uh, it, it really, uh, you know, it, it's, it's quite of a shock. Well, it's also a dangerous police state development when they ban Michael Savage and others. I've, they've tried to block me from coming into Canada, but became a big diplomatic uh, fight and they had to back off. But I mean, now they're talking about not letting U.S. citizens leave if they claim we haven't paid our taxes, but there's no judge or jury involved. I mean, this is also an issue of, of just being able to travel. Yeah, it's 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 ridiculous. I mean, it's um, it's one of those things where uh, the way the law is written on this particular law, too, is it's written in such a way that it's so vague that you really have very little wiggle room. You can't use comparisons. You can't say, well, you've allowed in. You know, X, Y, and Z, who have, you know, resumes that you wouldn't believe. And you can't say that, you know, here I am, a law-abiding citizen, you know, with a 20-year-plus history of going to the U.K. as a military officer and also as a professional contractor with zero incident, with no, never been cited for even a parking ticket, let alone, you know, inciting vigilanteism, and uh, just haphazardly get presented uh, in a very dramatic fashion this letter at an airport here in the U.S., well, regardless of what we think of Michael Savage's political views, just because he criticizes radical Islam, uh, they banned him from going to the UK. They're talking about banning uh, people like him from uh, other countries. Were you aware of Michael Savage's case? Yes, I was. Um, and that's why it was funny. When, when some of these comments were coming out um, in September uh, about me, 
it's just I dismissed it only because you know the the Fleet Street media over in um, the UK is, is very sensational, and so I'll have a story. Somebody will do a story on me saying the sun, and it'll be very sensational, very kill, kill, kill. You know the stuff that 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 sells on the tabloid side. And then there'll be a very sober piece done on me by, say, Financial Times, Forbes. I've had lots of, you know, coverage and very, you know, some of the bigger media. And I figured, you know, well, of course, people can see this balances out very quickly. And, um, you know, people can make a, a quick decision of, of, you know, who I am and what my background is. Um, <laughs> I quickly decided that, you know, that's probably not the case. And I better pay uh, more of attention to uh, things like this in the future. Well, let's expand on that because I know you want to be a you know, nice sport about this, but I'm sure you've seen the famous cases because it's been in the news over the years where they arrest people that defend themselves or, uh, on the street or even their home. So the UK is the ultimate nanny state. Those in control there and the bureaucracy, they do not want the people in the UK learning that they can defend themselves for whatever reason. I mean, do you disagree with that statement or why do you think they have this anti-self-defense uh, view? Oh no, Alex. Let me be really clear. That's that's. I've been very. Uh, you know, I think part of the reason I've got the media attention in the past is because I'll highlight a case. I'll highlight a case. You know, you nailed a couple on the on the intro. Um, I'll highlight a case like this, and and I tend to talk to them about you know the long history the UK had right up until about 1920, and then radically took a turn in the 1950s to where it was. Um, you know, they, they actually have pretty pretty similar self defense laws to us. Well, you're um, an expert you know, on this. Give us some of that history. Uh, well, you know, they, the real thing is, you know, when, when you go back, their greatest justice was Justice Blackstone. And he basically said personal responsibility is the most, you know, is inherent in every citizen. Basically, you know, it's, it's not up to the state to protect you first. It's you. You protect yourself and your family. And that pretty much held true up until about 1920. Um, that's when they enacted a firearms act that basically, you know, severely restricted who could get firearms. And um, the, the, the reasoning was was supposedly for, uh, you know, protection. But, you know, as, as most, you know, very sober, you know, analysts have looked at, it was far more of a fear of insurrection of the population than that. And I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not one of those, you know, totally pro-gun. It's, it's the way this country developed. And I'm fine with that. Where it really took a turn for the worse was in the 50s. In the 50s, um, there was a, an act that was put out by a parliament that, didn't, that allowed you to, uh, that, that said it was absolutely illegal for you as a citizen to help out somebody else in need. Somebody that's facing grievous bodily harm, if you intervened, you'd be liable for prosecution. And what that was, was an overreaction to the gang activity. There was street gang activity going in, uh, in various cities in, in, um, in the UK. And what you had was you had gangs using, uh, using the excuse of, I'm helping my, my friend out, my mate out, and that's why I got in this row. You know, this is why I got in this fight. Yeah, they always so, use criminals as a pretext to take our absolutely, rights. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, this is something that you know you you sit there and you say, the idea was the Brits would like you know you, in the UK. There's still a, a a very strong feeling amongst the authorities. This is not the population, but amongst the authorities, they want to keep it that you always have a first responder. That the police are the obvious. You know, choice. Well, the Metropolitan Police for uh, for London came out about three years ago and said we are no longer capable of being first responders. And so I've always been very pro, um, you know, pro victim, pro pro law abiding citizen. Um, and my method of training self defense is controversial because I give the full picture. Um, and, and that, that's where, that's where they try to ban me. That's where they try to say I'm ex an extremist. But if you do uh, get in a fight with somebody, I mean, you do, if they're attacking you, you want to get them off you as quickly as possible so they can't hurt you. Then the only way to do that is to hurt them. Well, what I, what I do is, and this is, this is worldwide. I mean, you know, we, we train all over the world and what I try to educate people about is as soon as you cross that physical plane, Alex, as soon as you put your hands on another person, no matter what your intentions were, you don't know where it's going to end up. And therefore, the incident that you choose to cross that physical plane better be justified, meaning it better be a situation that truly warrants you using physical action on somebody. Because 
even if you're trying to do things like, uh, you know, just shut a guy up. You know, I, I have clients that'll come in and say, oh, yeah, you know, just I don't want to kill the guy, but just show me how to put put his hands on, you know, you know how can I shut this guy up? And, you know, can I punch him in the solar plexus? And I'll say, sure, you can punch him in the solar plexus. I said, and, and yeah, that'll take his air, all things being equal. But then again, he could look like Schwarzenegger in his prime, and you hit him to the solar plexus, and all of a sudden he turn, turns purple, grabs his heart, and you don't realize that, you know, he has a genetically bad heart. You just caused an arrhythmia and the guy dies over what? Because he spilled the drink on you. So what I do is I, I spend a lot of time, you know, talking about what is avoidable and what is not avoidable. Now, where the media ignores me is, especially in the UK, which, which really just irritates me. I'm the first one to talk about all the avoidable, you know, the pub fights. There, there's lots of gratuitous um, anti-social aggression in the UK. There's lots of pub fights, football hooliganism, a lot of avoidable violence that people tend to get involved with, which is what the authorities try to say anybody like me is is uh, advocating, that I'm thinking that you got to get no, out No, the thugs there. are acting like that because they know they're dealing with a bunch of sheep. So well, because, yeah, stay there, we're going to come right back, and I, and I want you to break this down. And then I want to bring an example in Kelly Thomas and the police are, you know, using techniques on somebody who it looks like is not resisting, uh, you know, into the confrontation and they kill him. So I want to break that down straight ahead. If you believe in this information, I want to support its viral spread. Go to the InfoWars store at InfoWars.com. We've got the new G.I. Joe InfoWars t-shirts. We've got the incredible ProPure gravity-fed filters available at InfoWars.com in the store. We've got a new DVD, Sign Us Under Attack, the Don't Tread on Me flag. We've got all sorts of different bumper stickers to help spread the rebellion virally. It's all there. Wristbands, citizen rule books in every order. Order online at InfoWars.com today. The water filters, the canteens, it's all there. InfoWars.com. Jim Larkin of TargetFocusTraining.com, one of the leading self-defense experts out there, and he really is. Everybody says they are, but we've done other uh, research, uh, you know, trains government, military, police, you name it, is our guest. This is a short segment, and I kind of sprung that on you because I had the article here in front of me, and during the break you said, no, I'd really like to talk about Kelly Thomas, father, retired police officer, schizophrenic, everybody knew him in the town, not a bad guy, and he's tired of the cops talking to him all the time. And they say, hey, I'm going to F you up with these fists. They start swatting him. He gets on the ground. Uh, because, again, there's another side to this. The police now know all these uh, techniques to kill people with their fist. And they're using it and enjoying it and killing a lot of people. What's your take on that, uh, Mr. Larkin? Yeah, you know, what, what I think the problem is, it's kind of a problem inherent in most training in the industry is there's lots of talks about, hit here, kick here, control here, do this. And there's no discussion on trauma of the human body. There's no background on what can actually happen to the human body when you put systemic traumas like that into it. And that's the biggest problem, especially with the police. Um, what I'm finding is there's a, there's a twofold thing going on with the cops that you have to realize. One, there's a lot of good cops out there, as we all know. The problem is they don't police the bad cops the correct way, meaning what will happen is you'll have a, an incident like what you're talking about right now, which, you know, hey, there's no justification for, for what went on. But the problem is you're going to have an overreaction. What you're going to have is kind of a, a UK-British reaction. Rather than you severely discipline, prosecute, the people that abuse their positions. But you then don't go and come out with some ridiculous requirement. No, they're going to nanny state, not just the police. They're going to yeah. start trying to ban jujitsu clubs. Absolutely. As you know. Yeah, that's that, going to. That, yeah. That's what you're going to see. And you're going to also see cops, you know, who they're not going to be able to train anymore. What, what, what happens is we went from, you know, I had great uncles that were Boston cops that Basically, if a guy pulled a knife, they'd pull out their nightstick, they'd hit him in the wrist, and they'd arrest him. Today, we shoot him. Why? Because of how we train officers. We do not train officers correctly, you know, that way. The problem is, when you have a bad cop, when you have a guy that abuses and severely, you know, injures somebody, if not kills them, what happens is the whole force pays for it, and how do they pay for it? With lousy training. 
So the intended, you know, the, the political correctness of saying, you know, oh, okay, we're only going to hit these areas of the human body. Well, they only work on the people you don't care about. When you truly have somebody that you have to arrest correctly, you need to understand how to, in the most humane manner, and what I mean by that is if a guy has a knife and he's deranged, you know, there are, if, if, if police were better trained, they wouldn't have to always just, you know, go to lethal force. Well, I want you to break this down because you're I mean, just a great expert to have here. It's very exciting because I have a lot of questions. I've been arrested five or six times protesting peacefully. They show up, they say, no protests allowed. We go First Amendment whether it's for a Second Amendment rally or a property rights rally or whatever, or as media covering the G20. They arrest my reporters, I've been arrested, and they always slam my head in the wall, put the cuffs on, wrench it up, pull my arm halfway out of socket. Uh, and I'm like, why do they do that? Uh, because, I mean, because it really creates bad PR as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's again, it's, it, it comes down to the way the way officers are trained, and oftentimes, you know, you're going to have, for every cop that, that, that does that, you're going to have a cop that actually goes out of their way to do that. And again, I'm very balanced on this because I've trained tons of SWAT Sure, but I'm saying zero, zero resistance. Like, I got arrested once by state police. Yeah, there's, there's no, listen, there's no, there's, there's, you have a lot of guys that have attitudes out there, and they probably should, you know, they probably shouldn't be in the job. You have to be incredibly patient, you know, especially with a, with a citizen that's exercising, you know, their, their right to protest. Um, and then if they're doing a non, you know, nonviolent protest like that and they're being taken away, there has to be, you know, and again, you know, they get frustrated and they do stuff. I'm not justifying any of it, but here's the issue. Because they're not correctly trained uh, on, on, you know, injury to the human body, I just had a, a police officer in, in Australia who was an affecting arrest, kind of a similar situation that you're talking about. He was trying to get the cuffs on somebody and he was in the front of them and his knee was right over the spleen. Uh, you know, on, on the torso, and he didn't realize that every time he was adjusting his body weight and coming down, his knee, not brutally, if you and I were looking at it, it would almost look like he was doing a, a slight bounce. But because it was placed right over the spleen, he ended up uh, snapping, snapping the guy's rim, doing blunt trauma to the spleen, and that guy ended up bleeding out. And it was because of lack of knowledge. Of wow, stay there, stay there. The truth is the human body is incredibly fragile. <laughs> I mean, it is easy to kill somebody, and we have an expert, Tim Larkin, in it. Not just an expert how to defend yourself, but an expert how to not kill somebody just because uh, you're putting handcuffs on them. We're going to break it down. Log segment coming up, Tim Larkin. His website's targetfocustraining.com. He's banned in the U.K. as a thought criminal. Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure, but if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Tim Larkin is our guest. He is a trainer of the Navy SEALs, Army, uh, state agencies, police, you name it. And he was going over there to the UK saying, hey, you've got a right to defend yourself. And I'd see this footage of just hordes of people running up to people coming out of restaurants or out of hotels and beating them up. And I don't claim to be Mr. Tough Guy, folks, but I'm going to defend my wife. I'm going to defend my children. And as this world gets crazier and crazier, I think I need to you know, get these DVDs and do this training because I've been in a few fights, you know, growing up in North Texas, Dallas, Fort Worth area. And I guess a lot of this stuff seems like common sense, uh, but, uh, you know, falling through with a punch, don't just kick somebody, stomp them. But it's all done in an expert way. But the larger point is, is that people that are assaulting you don't care about you, so you have a right to defend yourself. Then there's the other issue of the police now have, have trained in similar systems to this. 
and they're doing it to people that are held down on the ground. So we're going to finish up uh, on that point and then get into other areas he wants to cover because I need to stop asking the questions, let him get into whatever he thinks is important. Uh, but targetfocustraining.com is the website if you want to find out more. Very, very interesting information. Before we go back to our guest, um, we have a lot of great products available at Infowars.com, the very best that I use. It also funds our media operation, the nightly news, the syndicated radio, the documentary films, the news websites, Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. If you go to Infowarsshop.com or Infowarsstore.com, that'll take you right to our shopping cart. Or just click on the shopping cart link at Infowars.com. You can find the Pro Pure Gravity Fed System, and I've done the studies myself, I've looked at it. Next to the competition, there's no competition. It's the best gravity-fed filter out there, available at InfoWarsShop.com. And you put the product code WATER in at checkout, you get a 10% discount on the already lowest price out there. Also, you can get all of my films and books and materials at InfoWarsShop.com. But also a noble lie, Oklahoma City bombing exposed, Farmageddon exposing the police state takeover, of the farms in this country by Big Agra. Uh, also, uh, a lot of other books and, and materials at InfoWars.com, and your purchases make the broadcast and what we do here possible. Going back to Tim, you got cut off by the break, Tim. We were getting into uh, the police versus citizens. I mean, I guess when you're teaching citizens, police, anybody, uh, I mean, it, it needs to be the focus of what is the force continuum, how do you not get jacked up on adrenaline, or after you've gotten somebody off of you, how do you not stomp on their neck and kill them and then have to deal with that whole uh, headache, uh, you know, versus not having any training at all? Yeah, and that, that's that's really the, the crux of uh, my passion and why, you know, why I continue to do this after, you know, all these years. It's, it's the education process that you're really talking about, Alex. The biggest problem out there in self-defense, martial arts, control tactics, um, defensive tactics, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's really when you're putting hands on the human body. And we usually only get half the story. So these guys will stomp to the head, kick to the neck, do stuff because nobody's really told them, oh, by the way. When the body is on the ground like that and you tend to put, you know, strikes into it and kicks, there's no place for the, the body weight to move away. If you and I are standing up and I push you, you're going to fall back because the human body will, will go away from the strike. When you're on the ground, the, the planet's supporting you and your body weight can't move, so it's going to absorb all of those strikes. So the trauma spike goes far up. Most people die when you know in in these kind of pub fights in, in and out in the streets when they go to the ground and people start putting it into them at the ground especially when it's a drunken brawl where people die is they die from the fact that they fall into the ground their body weight can't move and it absorbs all of the trauma and people tend to when somebody's on the ground be able to put all of their body weight into the strikes whether they want to or not but what the interesting thing that we found over the years when we started doing this in the special operations community and then the law enforcement community we had when people were educated in you know justified lethal force when they're when they're when they're actually told at that level they, there's very little training at the level of kill or be killed and what i mean by that is we will talk about every other level of the force continuum where you know you control somebody you, you give them this hold you do that but a guy that truly is going after you and trying to kill you maybe grabbing your weapon or or you know trying to do you know real grievous bodily harm to you there's very little training on how to deal with that normally what they'll tell you is just do whatever it takes which I think is just a horrible answer. And so what we do is we start there. If I start somebody at justified lethal force and I show them what trauma of the human body actually does, here's the result. People are actually less likely to ever abuse the situation unless warranted. What we found was the police officers that we trained, when they were trained with the justified lethal force, there were less incidences of excessive use of force down the line because they had a gross understanding of what happens to the body you know, when you do things. Once you inherently know that, hey, if I do this, here's the potential damage I can do, and it's not warranted, you won't do it. Whereas if your life is on the line, concurrently, because you know what that'll do, that particular strike could probably save your life. Sure, let's say somebody has attacked you, they've tackled you, whether you're a citizen, police officer, whatever, you beat them off of you, they keep coming. At a point, you've got to make the decision, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put this guy out because they're not stopping. 
Yeah. Yeah. The majority of, uh, uh, you know, on the civilian side, the majority of the civilians that we've trained over the past 20 years, what we talk about is taking a, taking a human being to non-functional, meaning in the threats that we're talking about, asocial violence, where it happens to you, you don't have choice, meaning there's no exit. You've tried to negotiate. You can't. It's happening. The guy is stabbing at you. He's coming at you at that point where if you do not take action, you are, as you know, Mike Murphy, the CSI coroner out here in Vegas told me, he said, Tim, he said, if you don't take action, all you're going to do is be able to help me solve your murder. He said, he said, make sure that you're showing these people how to take decisive action and get real injury on the human body. He goes, because the survivors get to talk to the cops. He said, everybody else comes to me and all I can do is solve your murder. And, and I take that to heart, you know, of really defining that area. Now, what's great about that is that's a very rare occasion when you would ever, ever be justified to use that type of information. And what, you know, the greater part of my training really revolves around is letting everybody know all the avoidable stuff that they don't have to respond physically to. They don't have to respond in a violent way where it can end up where you don't, you know, where you don't want it to go. You get in an argument with a guy, you go back and forth, you end up, you know, pushing each other. You say, screw this. You hit the guy in the face. He falls over, brains himself. And now you're facing manslaughter charges over the fact that he was grabbing your bar stool. It doesn't hit the three, three day taste. Whereas you're at Virginia tech, the, the shooter's going for a reload. You cruise over there, you hit him to the head, you brain him on the concrete and you kill him. Guess what? That's justified. Now you're a hero. Yes. But it's all, it's all with education Alex. And where I get into trouble is people don't, what they'll do is I'll say, Hey, I gave a demonstration a couple of years ago uh, for the, the Sun. The Sun news paper in the UK sent a group over. And I was showing them a typical strike set that's shown in the martial arts. It was just four strikes. And I showed that doing the strikes, you know, here's how they go. And everybody's, oh, that's really cool. That's really cool. And I go, great. It's really cool. Then I systemically showed them that those strikes, what they were doing to the human body, and that by doing it that way, it was a guaranteed kill. And everybody was shocked. It went from being a really cool technique to, oh my God. And they were simple strikes to do. And I was sitting there saying, without the education of the trauma, you inadvertently could do something stupid that's not justified for the situation. So my, my whole thing was education and self-defense saying we gotta do this. You know what the son did with that? They took the headline and they said, I can kill you in four moves. And that, that's what they ran with that. And then they also took liberty and they decided, you know, we don't really like his background. So we're going to call him a former Navy SEAL, even though, you know, I blew my ears a couple of weeks before graduation and I had to switch over to the intelligence community. My whole story of my background and the reason I'm so Yeah, we even is, got that wrong until you pointed it out because every newspaper yeah. says you're a former Navy SEAL. And then I bet you get accused of saying you were one when you weren't. Dude. I have been, what's so funny is I worked only in the community. I was an intelligence officer. I worked for the, for Admiral Lemoyne back in the eighties. I worked directly for the highest SEAL command. My whole career was in special warfare, but it was as an intelligence officer. All my friends know this. I wouldn't be training the people. If I was some guy going around pretending to be something I'm not, there's no way I'd have the career. But I'll tell you, the press is just amazing. Trying to get that you know, retracted has been a nightmare. And the problem is it goes around. But the whole story, the reason it's so funny is because when I blew my ears, I, I, I you know, my eardrum got blown underwater and my semicircular canals en en ended out. An injury to my inner ear ended my career. No matter how much I willed it, no matter how much I wanted to overcome it, no matter how much personal, you know, fortitude I the put in. The body is delicate. The body is delicate. An injury, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's what my whole thing is. And so the, the thing is, if you try to go out there and you try to be sane and socialized and say, hey, listen, there is absolutely a time when the only answer is violence, then you're going to be vilified as promoting violence. You're going to be vilified as somebody who's out there, you know, as they said, promoting vigilanteism and all this other ridiculous stuff, rather than looking at, the, at, at what a, a citizen is facing out there these days, especially citizens of the UK, as you said, you've got a lot of Eastern Europeans coming in. Knife culture is huge there. Stuff they were never facing. I went to university in 86 over there. I went to the University of London on an exchange program. It was unthinkable, some of the crimes that are now readily happening in, in London these days. And yet, the authorities are still acting like, you know, you as a citizen do not respond. You were, uh, you, you've even brandishing something. There was a young mother who uh, 
had a couple of kids jump over into her, her lot, her place has been broken into. Now, she didn't actually even use the butcher knife. She just was in her kitchen window. She showed the butcher knife, scared out of her death. She has her infant upstairs, and the two, the two teenage guys looked at her kind of menacingly, and then they just left. They jumped. They felt, you know what, I'm not going to deal with this. She's got a knife. She calls the cops, scared out of her mind. They come over. When she tells them the story, they're debating on whether or not they have to arrest her. And they, they chastise her. And because she was on a reality TV show over there, they decided not to. But that, they were more concerned, rather than the, the threat she was facing, they were far more concerned that she might actually try to protect herself. And it's asinine. But look at the crime statistics. Uh, if you look at areas like Chicago or New York, where they have a, basically a, a total gun ban, they have the highest crime rates and uh, homicide rates. And then take somewhere like Texas or Vermont, even around the big cities, there's a much lower home invasion rate because people know half the houses you go into, if you go in there when somebody's there, they're going to shoot you. I mean, it's really simple. <clears throat> Listen, Alex, here, here's, here's the bottom line. The bottom line is each one of us as human beings possesses the greatest concealed carry that nobody can control, and that's your mind. We cannot, we cannot outlaw intent. What we do is we make the mistake. We make the mistake of thinking by outlawing tools. We have outlawed all weapons. We all possessed one weapon, and I'm not being dramatic here. Our weapon is the human brain. The human brain has done everything from, you know, create the space shuttle to create nuclear war, you know, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons. It, it's just that creative. We are not the top, you know, the top species on Earth because we are bigger, faster, and stronger. And I tell people all the time, if anybody thinks that, you just, you know, just tell me who wants to get in a 10 by 10 cage with a 45-pound mountain lion that hasn't eaten in three days. You know, we are not. We are, we are dangerous, and we are also brilliant because we have this mind, and we cannot outlaw intent. If somebody wants to do harm to you, they will find a way to do it. And all you have to do is look at the prison population. If you study how the prisoners use violence as a tool, you'll see just how ingenious the human mind is when it wants to be. Yeah, and they would just put that intent into working and ideas and sales They'd be living in a million-dollar house instead of in a hellish prison. But that's it. That's just it, Alex. The people that are doing that are, are, are people that we want to protect. The guys, the, the great people that are taking the human mind and using it for the best to, to improve society, we're also the ones most at risk, and we're not allowed. We are told that if we look at the tool of violence, if we study the tool of violence, we will become one of them. We'll be a bad guy. It's the biggest sham that's out there. But I feel incredibly secure. A lot of radio hosts get threatened. People do stuff. They, they shoot them. Not me. I got a gun in my car. I know how to use it. I've got one here in my studio in a little instant access pistol safe. And it's not even a big deal. It's like I got a pen over here if I need to write. Uh, I've got video cameras. I've got a, a microphone. And it's just there in the one chance out of... 5,000 that somebody ever came in here and tried to do something. And, and for so many people, that is a shocking idea that, that I would defend myself. That's, that's alien to them, and that shows this attempt to fully domesticate us. But that's the same thing. What I try to tell people all the time, I go, what you're, what you're, you're acting, you know, people like to believe the world is a certain way rather than the way it is. And the thing is, if you, if you accept the world for the way it is, then you do certain things. And most people do it in their daily lives, meaning most people have a fire extinguisher in their house. Now, does that mean they're paranoid about fire? Does that mean that they're constantly thinking about it, that they're just ridiculous for having it there? No, because they're saying, worst case scenario, I've taken a, I have a plan of action. I, I do everything to make sure that, you know, my house is not going to catch fire. I do all the normal things, make sure that I, I, I take, care, take care of everything. I don't have bad electricity or bad, bad wiring, all those things. But you know what? I'm still going to have this fire extinguisher, even though it's going to be really rare that I would ever have to use it. But if you take that same approach to your self-protection or your self-defense, you are shown, you know, that, that you're a bad person. And, and what I try to tell people all the time is I give an analogy. I say, listen. Let's, 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 let's take a look at this. A door gets kicked in. There's a young woman, you know, uh, in, in her kitchen. Baby's upstairs. Guy attacks her. You know, they're, they're, he's, he's strangling her. He's trying to attack her, trying to sexually assault her. Um, she, sees a, she sees the butcher's knife, and she, she reaches back for that butcher's knife, and she's successful. She plunges it in the side of the neck, and she's able to, uh, she's able to defeat this guy. She actually ends up killing him, okay? 
we as society would look at that situation and we'd say she needs to be protected to the full extent of a law. She needs to be lauded for what she did. She did everything she could do to protect the baby. Um, you know, and, and we, we, we all hope that that's going to be the case. Now, let's look at that same thing. Kicks the door open again. Comes through. This time they're in the, the epic struggle. She tries to reach for that butcher's knife. He sees it. He's angry because he's not getting what he wants. He grabs the butcher's knife. He plunges it into the side of the neck, killing her, you know, murdering her. Now, we all agree that in that situation, that was a heinous murder, completely unjustified. This guy should face, you know, life imprisonment, if not the death penalty, if that's available. But bottom line, he should never see the light of day in society again. What I try to tell people is, listen, folks, what I need you to understand is the knife to the side of the neck worked in both instances, whether it was the good guy or the bad guy using it. It does not make you bad to study this. You need to study this because you need to know what works if your life is ever on the line. How you use the information will determine whether or not it was justified. But I'm not worried about the same socialized humans that I train because the predators don't need me. They don't need me. They already know how to do this kind of stuff. They may not have the technical knowledge I have, but they have boatloads of intent and they have no need for seeking me out. What I try to do is I try to get through to people like my clients in the UK that say, hey, listen, folks. It's okay to look at this stuff. It doesn't make you one of them. And guess what? They don't want you to look at this stuff because it'll put you on par with them if they ever threaten you. Very well said. Final segment with our guest. Amazing interview. Uh, and the conclusion of it straight ahead. The website is targetfocustraining.com. Tim Larkin is our guest. I'm Alex Jones of Infowars.com. Stay with us. Have you been to InfoWarsShop.com lately? Express your inner patriot with these brand new InfoWars t-shirts. Say it loud with the InfoWars bullhorn shirt. Or educate the sheeple with the Bill of Rights shirt. Grope the public's mind with the TSA shirt. And with this shirt, you can let the dark side know of the Rebel Alliance's power. All available at InfoWarsShop.com. I have a son and I have two daughters and the, the daughters are sm smaller. You know, my son is um, almost 10. Uh, my daughters are younger and I find myself taking him shooting, taking him hunting, uh, you know, teaching him basic self-defense. And I catch myself and my daughters, the ones that are really going to need it. I'm not teaching him any of it. I mean, I've done some shooting with a seven year old. Um, and, and, and she doesn't like it as much. That, you know, that's part of the role. But I think of this, uh, of people that have, they send their daughters off to college without any self-defense, without knowing how to use a gun, any of it, and that it's bad to want women to know how to fight or how to use a gun. You know, the feminists just want to teach women how to hate men, the mainline feminist, because it's another form of enslavement. What do you say to that, Tim? Um, again, uh, Tim uh, Larkin, uh, trainer of uh, U.S. military, Navy SEALs, you name it, banned in the U.K. <laughs> That's me great advertising uh, for the work you do. But, but what's a good way to start? Because before you know it, they're going to be, you know, teenagers. What is a good way, or for my wife for that matter? Because uh, you know, I mean, I forget the fact that I took some basic martial arts when I was you know, in junior high and stuff and played football and all that. And just a lot of that just comes natural to a guy. What about for women? Because they're the ones that really need it, aren't they? I mean, men need it as well. But uh, what do you say to women out there where the culture says, don't learn how to fight, don't learn how to shoot? I have a, uh, I have a, a book that I'm working on right now. It'll be coming out next year for women. Uh, you know, the, the title on it is Survive the Unthinkable. And women are, have been a huge focus of mine. It's extremely difficult to get women by themselves to come in seeking self-defense training because, of course, they've they've always been taught bigger, faster, stronger, uh, nothing you can do, talk your way out of it, don't get them angry. Um, in fact, I had a woman come up to me in Sydney one time. I was doing a, a big presentation down in Australia for a large group, and she came up to me after the presentation, and she said to me, she said, you know, I've taken three self-defense classes, and the only thing I ever remembered was don't kick a man in the groin because it might anger him. And she said, that's it. She goes, I've been living, you know, fearfully about this. She said, the way you laid things out and explained it, I, I now understand 
that I'm capable of protecting myself. And, and there's a huge difference, Alex, when you look at women. I will, I, you know, it's rare that I'll train a boy younger than 18. It's rare. A parent, if a parent okays it, I'll do it. And the reason is, we as males live with intermale aggression, you know, this locker room back and forth. And, you know, you want most boys to navigate high school without this information because they don't have the proper filters oftentimes to deal with this. Whereas girls, the only time they experience violence is when it's the real thing. Women don't have that inner rail, locker room aggression where, you know, hey, you and I will knock each other around to see who's, you know, who's the badass and, and, and you know, I own the locker room and, and you take your social status and all that stuff. You know, that's the inner male aggression stuff. That's not violence. Whereas women, they experience the real thing. And the cool thing about training women is there's no ego involved. Women are, if you teach them technique, they absolutely do it that way. They don't try to muscle anything. They rapidly outpace the males in their ability to do this correctly. And the analogy that gets through to most women is when they think that they're completely powerless against a bigger, stronger guy, as I asked them, I said, hey, when was the last time you held a small infant? You know, I have a, currently I have a 20 month old. And if I have that little guy and I'm holding him up, he'll throw his head back, hit me in the nose, poke me in the eye. And you know, I am, I am, you know, basically, you know, mildly injured and out of it for a little bit of time. And what I say is, you know, you know, remember, remember how that felt. Now you look at a child throwing a fit. You, yeah. you know, can we do five more minutes to finish up on this? Yeah. All right, one minute break. Gonna be back in one minute to finish up because we're this hour is over. And then a big news blitz coming up. We'll come back and break that down. Absolutely, women. If you're gonna get attacked anyways, you might as well be able to fight back. I mean, does that mean you're gonna be able to beat Mike Tyson? I don't know. You get women mad. It's it's something else. The point is, absolutely, we need to, to get women to know how to fight. My point is, is that your children grow up so fast, before you know it, you know they're going to be out there, uh, you know, alone, and it's just the roles are so ingrained to to not have women know how to defend themselves that even, you know, I, I'm a guy, pro-Second Amendment, you know, liberty, constitutionalist, and I'm not really teaching my daughters that stuff it's just instinctive well you know a male is interested in that my son wants to know about that he's into that because that's what males do but then you see the so-called feminist they're always about women uh, you know basically uh just henpecking at men and just some political power i'm talking about gloria steinem and stuff uh, finishing up with what you were saying about a baby and how hard they are to control tim yeah, well, you know, uh, uh, the, the problem is, you know, when you talk about, you know, a woman going against Mike Tyson, that's the problem. That's what they see. Whereas, you know, I was, uh, you know, 10 years ago, my son, uh, my, my older son, oh gosh, it was long. I hate to admit I'm that old, but it was, uh, it was actually 13 years ago. My son, a four, little four-year-old came over and I think he was going to try to give dad a hug. He trips over his little feet and his little hands come up, slap me in the groin. And I swear, Alex, I'm on the ground for five minutes just sucking my thumb completely helpless, you know, at that point. Now, that's what predators give you the opportunity to do. I felt no, you know, my son, obviously, we know if we put myself and a four-year-old in the ring and we all knew what was going on, we know how that would end up. But predators, the reason they seek you out is because they don't think you're an issue. And oftentimes they will put vulnerable parts of their body close to you and give you an opportunity to do that one injury that we're talking about that can change everything in your favor. And if a small child can do it to a fully grown adult, use a fully grown adult, even if you weigh 95 pounds, who wants to, fight, to feel 95 pounds going through one part of a vulnerable Well, exactly. I mean, have you ever tried to, like, take your cat to the vet and it doesn't want to go in the cage and Absolutely. it'll tear you up? I mean, resistance is victory. Bottom line, you teach folks the most effective ways to resist. Absolutely. And, and, and clearly defined, twofold. You, you, you get two things. You understand all the things. You know, my clients tell me two things. They go, boy, I've really modified my behavior because you've really taught me all the things I was taking chances with over the years that I no longer participate in. But I also immediately recognize those rare times where, hey, you know what? I, I would have to do violence here. I have to, I have to protect myself. And, and I completely switch into that mode. That's the greatest gift you could ever, if you're a parent, it's that type of, uh, of understanding that you give your kids, you know, prior to life, because it's one of those 800 pound gorillas that's in the room. Nobody wants to talk about, you know, a physical threat to you, but it's something that we're all worried about. 
I, I put it, I, I asked most parents this, I go, how many people have taught your kids how to swim? And they all, they all, you know, raise their hands. Well, why did you do that? Well, because I don't want them to drown. I go, oh, you don't, I thought it was because you all want them to become Olympic swimmers. And they go, no, 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 I, you know, you don't want them to drown. I go, same reason you want to teach people how the human body responds to trauma. Not because you want them to be a world-class MMA artist or martial artist or anything. It's because you want them to... Chances want them are they're going to get mugged, they're going to get attacked, and yeah. they need to have that skill. Good people need to stop being domesticated. In closing, just in my experiences in life, I've learned how serious fights can be. I've just gotten to the point, because you run into it, somebody tailgates you, cuts you off, gets in my face. I just have learned to be satisfied and walk away, and, and you know, usually people back off. I mean, what do you do if somebody gets in your face for no reason and says, hey, I'll kick your butt, buddy? What do you do? Just turn and walk away, or what do you do? Alex, I'll give you the perfect example. I, I went to pick up my son when he was about, my older son, when he was about uh, 10 years old. I was going to drop him off at, at a park with his grandfather, and I was in San Diego about to give a seminar. And I, I come out from, uh, from where my son was, I, I, you know, picking my son up. We pull out, guy comes by, he, he, he claims that I ran him off the road. He looks at me, he starts, he starts yelling in the car, fl you know, flipping me off. My son's looking at me like, Dad, what's this all I'll about? I'll tell you what, I know you, listen, I'm not trying to keep you on here more, but we gotta come back, finish this story, and then we'll let you go. I gotta hear this, what a cliffhanger. That's a short segment. Tim Larkin's our guest, uh, targetfocustraining.com. Tim Larkin um, is about to leave us. I appreciate him staying a little bit in the second hour because, or the third hour because we uh, ran out of time. He was starting to tell a story about you know how his classes are or uh, mainly about ways to not have that confrontation, but then what to do if there's no way out of it and that force continuum there. But I was describing, because I see it more and more, and it's not just me saying this, the uh, crime statistics show it. I see it everywhere. I drove back from the Texas coast from Port Aransas back to Austin yesterday, left about five o'clock, got home by dark. And I've never seen so much road rage. People in the slow lane pulling up behind you, pulling up behind other people, flipping each other off. Uh, I see men bowing up to each other constantly as the economy falls apart. There's a lot of stress. And then men want to feel like they're successful because of, I guess, the male prowess if I had to psychologically analyze it, psychoanalyze it. You see that with the police, the police taking roids, uh, and, and you've got the media hyping all these threats and all this fear. I mean, I'm just trying to analyze it. For whatever reason, I'm seeing, I guess, the MMA culture, whatever, and I'm not even saying that's a bad thing overall, people wanting to go out and have some rite of passage. Maybe they didn't have it in high school or college, I don't know. Uh, but uh, a lot of times I find it's, it's older, you know, like middle-aged guys who actually haven't been in a lot of fights. Uh, once I, you know, look into who they are later and some of the uh, cases I see in the newspaper and people I know, I mean, maybe I'm just grabbing at straws here. For whatever reason, uh, finishing up with that question here with our guest of TargetFocusTraining.com, uh, self-defense expert Tim Larkin, who trains Navy SEALs, you name it. Tim, are you seeing more fights on the streets and things, not just in England, but also here in the U.S., A, why, and then B, finish the story you started before the break where I was asking you, what do you do when you go down to the bar district to eat at a nice restaurant and some guy for no reason goes, what you looking at, punk, and you're not even looking at him, and you're like, uh, nothing, and they think, just because you're clean cut, that you'll back off and it's like some little counting coup for them and their buddies. And then you give them what they want and you say, I don't see anything, mister, and walk away. So then they say something else and start walking towards you. What do you do when just everything in you wants to turn around and punch them right in the throat? What do you do at that point? Well, that, that's the challenge. And that, that's really what I do. I, I guess, the, you know, to illustrate, you know, the reason, that we, I'll, I'll tell you where I changed tactics. I wasn't always this way. You know, in, in my 20s, I was doing a lot, a, lot, a lot of work with the military, doing a lot of really fun stuff. And I thought I was invulnerable. And I made a huge, huge mistake in, in the idea that I had been working down in South America. And I came back up to San Diego and I was hanging out with my friends and we're having a great, great time. And I'm driving. Guy, again, we're talking bumper to bumper traffic and some guy thinks I cut in front of him. It was absolutely asinine. Guy gets in front of me. Well, he's raging. He's getting, you know, all, you know, he's behind me. And he's getting all just worked up. And I'm a couple of cars up. 
And of course, being a being a young guy and being, you know, hey, I just got out of the jungles down here. What, what threat is San Diego? I start like blowing kisses in the in the in the mirror behind, so he can see me because I just know it's just gonna it's gonna get him. My friends are laughing. Well, this guy over the period of like about five minutes is able to work through traffic to get ahead of me a couple of cars. Hits his brakes, gets out of the car, and I'm like, oh great, you know. So I get out of the car and I, I'm gonna go, you know, I'm gonna go get him, right? I get out of the car. I hear from the back. My buddy yells, "Gun!" And I go, oh, and I hit the deck. And sure enough, you know, had that guy had a gun, it would have been a clear shot at me, right? And I'm sitting there going, oh, man, that's stupid. Then I look. The guy doesn't have a gun. He has one of those clubs, you know, the thing that locks your uh, steering wheel. And so that, to me, wasn't a big deal. And I just I yelled something at my buddy for being an idiot. And I charged this guy. Guy tries to hit me. I grab him, grab him by the throat, throw him down the back of his, uh, of his car, throw him right down the back of his car, just about to put him out, right? You're going to get that justification for the idiot. You know, my, my ego's feeling really great. And what do I see? I see a little three-year-old girl face pressed up against the glass, going, crying, going, please don't hurt daddy. Today, you know, that image stuck in my head so many times so that when the incident that I was telling you about, my son, you know, and I driving and this guy just doing all the road rage stuff, he, he must have had a bad day. Maybe he's, an, he's in an office cubicle and he just decided, you know, I look like an easy, easy guy to go off on because, you know, he was making fun of the fact that I seem to be in good shape, all this other. He's trying to push every button on me. And I just told him, hey, have a good day and let him go. Dropped my son off and then went to, uh, went to, uh, you know, give my seminar. Now, the funny part about it was the, that week was the week that I came out on the cover of Black Belt Magazine, you know, as being, you know, a <laughs> self-defense instructor. And my son was just kind of, you know, laughing to himself going, Dad, does this guy? And I said, hey, Connor, I said, it makes no difference. I said, I just because I have my training doesn't prevent me from uh, being protected from violence. But the discipline of not using violence unless you absolutely have to wasn't it satisfying when you did the right thing? Because I know that whenever I do the right thing yeah. now, it's very satisfying. Alex, I tell everybody, I go, whatever action, if you're going to put your hands on somebody, you have to think, and you can't do this stuff in the heat of the moment. You have to sit down, cup of coffee, by yourself, and think about this kind of stuff. And you have to ask yourself, does that action that I'm thinking of doing, you know, to, to satisfy my ego on the road rage and be the, the alpha in the, in the road rage. And is it, is it going to pass the three-day test? Meaning, when I do this action, and if it ends up, now that I know I'm educated about violence, and I realize once I put my hands on this individual, either he or I could end up seriously injured or killed. Is that going to pass the three-day test? Three days from now, when I'm thinking about this incident, will I still sit there and say, yes, that was worth it? Very, very, very few situations meet that. Well, in closing, I'll tell you why the UK bans you, because I've seen this as part of a pattern. They want the monopoly of power. They're under that UN treaty uh, where they believe the state has the monopoly on power. And it's because you're cogent and charismatic and, and, and filled with veritas, common sense, they don't want you to be able to go over there and be the keynote speaker and have it all over the news and actually speak for yourself. They don't want the people in the UK to pick up on what you're saying and doing because it makes so much sense and it's despicable. But I think now because of the internet, uh, this is going to backfire a hundred times the people in the UK conservatively. This is all over the news now that would have learned about what you're teaching are now going to find out about it. And that's where tyrants always fail is they think they're going to win by shutting us down up front. But if we just keep on a coming, they can't win. Well, Alex, I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity on this forum. It's, it's been incredible. Well, it's been amazing having you. Thank you, Tim Larkin. Uh, the website where people can learn more, targetfocustraining.com. Are there any other websites folks should visit? Uh, I think you do 5 Second Survival. Uh, you know, they can spell it any, any different way. That's another great website where they get a lot of free information. Um, I'm providing my whole book for people to, to download so they can really see what we're all about. So they can kind of see that we're not, we certainly aren't vigilantes. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Thank you, Alex. Ask yourselves, what are you doing in this time of great challenge? What are you doing to unlock minds?